I was fortunate enough to uh, Keith survived earlier, so we'll kick it off uh, just a bit earlier than we thought we could. So over to you, Kong. Cool, thanks for that. Um, so we're lucky enough to have uh, Keith Munch uh, joining us this morning. Uh, Keith's the Director of Civil, Avia Civil Aviation New Zealand. Um, so Keith joined Civil Aviation Authority as the Chief Executive and the Director of Civil Aviation in February 2021. Prior to this, Keith was the Chief Executive and Director for Maritime New Zealand uh, for a period of nine years. <coughs> Excuse me. Keith brings strong experience as a regulator to the authority, along with considerable experience as a chief executive and in leading culture change programs. He is also a leader in the Government Regulatory Practice Initiative, which supports the prof professionalism of regulators and regulatory practice in central and local government in New Zealand. Prior to the Civil Aviation and Maritime, uh, Keith was in the police, New Zealand Police Force, 77 to 89, and has worked at senior levels in the Commerce Commission, Com Competition and Fair Trading Law Enforcement, Ministry for Consumer Affairs, Consumer Policy, Information and Education, Trade Measurement, Electricity and Gas Safety, Department of Internal Affairs, Gambling, Censorship, Anti-Money anti Laundering, Anti-Spam, Identity and Civil Defence, and the Ministry of Social Development, Benefit Fraud, Debt Collection and Data, data Matching, and the Real Estate Agents Authority, Licensing and Compliance. So if you'd welcome Keith. Uh, thank you, Colin. Um, and, um, Thanks for the opportunity to come and join you in this seminar. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be making some comments at a pretty high level around the organisation and uh, the opportunities and challenges we have at that sort of whole of organisation level. Um, obviously, from what you've heard, I'm not an aviation person by background, not an engineer, not a pilot, any of that sort of stuff. So I am a, um, a regulator. And given the organisation's focus on uh, being an aviation safety and security regulator, we obviously have to have a wide range of skills and knowledge. Um, and plenty of people in the organisation bring all the aviation stuff, as you know, because you work with them, and some of you have come to work with us from the DDH world or vice versa. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I will just jump into it um, and happy to uh, engage or have discussion along the way or at the end. All right, so I thought I'd just start by uh, painting the picture of the sort of broader context um, and talk a little bit about the, um, the VUCA model, which I think sort of certainly makes me think about where we're at. Um, we'll touch on the Air Navigation System Review, Sustainable Aviation Aotearoa, the Aerospace Strategy, something about the Civil Aviation Act, the Funding Review, um, our kind of why, what, how, so how we're framing our approach in the organisation. Uh, a little bit about modern regulatory practice, some of the key issues we're dealing with and how we're trying to navigate our way uh, through the environment that we're all operating in. So I start with this picture here, the aviation system. Uh, this has become one of my favourite uh, pictures in the sense that I think it tells us a lot we, that we need to know about where we're at as an aviation system. Uh, it's probably a little small maybe. This is from the Avi Aviation Navigation System Review document. Um, which started out as being a review of the naviga navigation elements of aviation, but is really a broader review of the aviation system. Um, what it tells me is that we've got um, airspace that is full of current and future airspace users, uh, airspace users increasingly. And when you look at the black and the green together, you can see the challenge around integration of the old and the new or the traditional and the emerging technologies. When you look at the ground level elements, uh, at the infrastructure that's required, particularly when you're thinking about new fuels and new propulsion systems and how that's serviced and supported. Um, this to me tells us we've got a very interesting um, system in which we operate. And many of you will work on things from a system perspective or from an individual participant or operator perspective. 
our view is very much across the whole thing and how it all works together as much as how the individual bits or parts or operations work. So, and this is happening in an environment which is, and I, I'm quite fond of the VUCA um, model, so volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. That, I think, describes the environment that we operate in generally. If you think about technological development, environmental challenges, particularly with aviation, uh, which aviation is responding to, but it's a big uh, uphill thing. The economic situation that we're in, uh, the political and the geopolitical considerations and dimensions that are applying to all of the work that we do as an organisation, because we obviously start at the ICAO level, we think about the international system, trickles down into New Zealand, how we deal with uh, domestic as well, uh, how we deal, we've got regional um, sort of sub-regional and regional and global interests that we have to uh, work with from an aviation perspective. So it's a pretty interesting environment to be in. The Air Navigation System Review itself um, has landed on a number of things that uh, it recommended that should be introduced into the system. The first is a thing called the Aviation Council. Uh, that is intended in my description to be a kind of a peak body that will um, drive or think about uh, or advise government on however you want to think about it on what's happening in the aviation system broadly. That will uh, likely be formally set up once the government is settled down, likely to be led by the Ministry of Transport involving significant aviation industry involvement at senior levels as well as uh, things like people like the Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Business Innovation, uh, Employment, Airways, CAA, etc. There is proposed to be a, a, a national aviation policy statement. So if any of you have had any contact with the um, uh, road and rail kind of world of transport, you know there's a government policy statement about road. Uh, and that drives investment and it drives decision making around how the government responds to requirements on, in road and rail. Um, arguably it would be ideal to have one of those for aviation as well so that we can all see the pathway um, and it, all, it would also have a potentially the effect of kind of committing governments over time uh, to a certain level of involvement in investment uh, etc in terms of what's happening with aviation and this is because aviation as we all know is absolutely critical to New Zealand given where we are um, and our economic and social connections that it creates um, it suggests a flight plan, so a pathway forward underneath the policy statement. It also suggests that there's got to be work done on a minimum uh, operating network. That's a little bit more driven from the navigation perspective, I think. Uh, there should be a benefits-led approach, so everything should be driven by understanding the benefits that will be created by the actions. Uh, there needs to be a workforce strategy. I'm sure you're all, you're all probably uh, find that resonates with you in terms of thinking about the skills and experiences we need in the system over time, given the changes that are occurring. Uh, important engagement with iwi Māori, uh, a regulatory roadmap. So for us, that's probably front and centre in terms of understanding where the regulatory systems, the, the legislation, the regulations, the rules will go over time. Uh, we can say at a high level that we think that you know, our regulatory, uh, our rules uh, set is largely not fit for purpose in many ways. Um, some of it is, some of it can be changed or worked around, some of it needs to be fundamentally reviewed. We should have a sense of where, you know, where all that is at and what, the road, and what the road map is for that. I don't know why they've moved from a flight plan to a road map, but anyway. Um, and an investment model rethink as well, because um, all of the agencies, the government agencies that involve, are involved in aviation uh, are challenged around resources and there are different funding models sitting behind them. Airways, for example, is a state-owned enterprise. We're a classic kind of crown agency, uh, crown entity regulator funded largely by industry fees, levies and charges with some government funding. And there's also a reference to international engagement which is so critical to us all and particularly in the emerging technology area when we're looking at certification pathways and how EASA are doing things, how FAA are doing things, what it means for New Zealand, you know, which approach we take, how we're joined up, that kind of stuff. So that's a big piece of work that will have long-term impacts as all of the recommendations are, are worked through, hopefully for the benefit of the system overall. 
the other thing, and this is where, curious, interestingly, there's a number of things that are responding to the current developments in aviation that may not be as joined up as would be ideal yet. So the idea of the Aviation Council, if you think of that as a sort of a peak body, would be a useful place to uh, join everything into so we can see all of the parts working together as well. One of those things at the moment is Sustainable Aviation Aotearoa. That is a, um, a group of industry and um, government agencies working on sustainable aviation fuel, transitioning to zero emissions, and the strategic elements of sustainable aviation. It's got a high level of uh, industry representation as, long as, as well as government um, engagement. Uh, there's, no, there's clearly ex explicitly set out that there is a key link between sustainable aviation and New Zealand's tourism environment because sustainable tourism require sustainable aviation given where we are in the world. So those sorts of connections, it's good to see them being made um, and if we can get the systems and the right um, small eye institutions working on all of those connections and the settings for us as a country that will be beneficial I'm sure. Um, this is a bit like Jet Zero in the UK, it's trying to do the same kinds of things um, and pre prepare the country for uh, sustainable aviation. We've also got the aerospace strategy. And uh, those of you that are involved in aerospace activity um, know that it's, it's driven from a government perspective around unlocking aerospace potential, uh, future-facing government aerospace nations. So they're the foundational pillars. It's not clear to me how the aerospace strategy will be uh, moved forward by whoever the new, well, whatever the shape of the new government is uh, next week and beyond. Um, it does have, this strategy has some fairly ambitious goals, uh, sustainable air passenger journey, integrating autonomous aerial vehicles, go back to that picture before, forefront of sustainable space activities, actively supporting exploration in space, enhanced decision making using aerospace enabled data. So the aerospace strategy probably leans more towards the space end of that spectrum. But now, obviously, we have aerospace activities um, in the form of space planes and the like. So it's another really important thing that is shaping and driving what happens in the aviation system. Um, and for us, it's got a really simple statement that you know our job is just to ensure safe entry and operation of aircraft as a regulator. That's pretty easy. So um, the level of this, this strategy, it's still pretty high level. And what we're finding is that uh, it needs more fleshing out as to what it really means for everybody in the system, particularly government agencies, what investment is required, what changes are required to systems, to rules, to legislation, etc., to support that um, ambitious strategy. So again, I'd go back to the Aviation Council, uh, the ANSR product, the Aviation Council, potentially as being the thing that will help to bring all of this stuff together. Certainly it will if, that's, if, we, can, uh, if we can be part of this uh, alongside the ministry um, and join everybody up around this sort of stuff. I think we'll have a better, a better opportunity in a, as a country to make sure this sort of stuff works well. Um, then getting down a little bit more to the sort of, for us anyway, the things that uh, affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. We have a new Civil Aviation Act. It was passed in 2023, you may be familiar with it. Um, and it comes into force in April 2025. Um, it continues from a CAA perspective to focus us primarily on the operation of a safe and secure civil aviation system. The Act also has some secondary purposes around uh, environment, health, safety, security, promoting economic prosperity and innovation. But the objective of the CAA remains focused on safety and security. Um, so there are no functions, there's no particular provisions in the Act that drive us towards anything to do with economic development of aviation, um, etc. So not a big change for us in terms of what the focus is. There's some things that will change. The drug and alcohol management uh, plans have been introduced or will be introduced as a mandated requirement. 
Uh, all of the rules have had, have had to be and are being realigned with the new legislation. That's not a process that allows a revision of the rules in, uh, in any fundamental way. What it will do is make sure that the, new, that the rules carry through some of the major themes that are uh, desired from the Civil Aviation Act, but it's minimal change to the rule set, leaving the question of what significant change is, need, is needed uh, to be dealt with at a later date. Uh, there's a review of the director's decision-making process, so any decision that we make um, that could otherwise have been appealed to a district court or another judicial body will be subject to independent review by uh, a person or persons that will be appointed by the minister for that purpose. So it provides, if you like, discipline around our decision making that can be formally reviewed short of taking things to court, which I'm sure you're all familiar with is a very expensive process. Um, it's not a process that will lead to an independent reviewer replacing the director or the director's delegate's decisions, but it will make sure that the process was appropriate um, to arrive at that decision. Um, if found not to be, my understanding is that it would then require the, the director or the delegate to make a fresh decision. It's, it is to, it's to fill the gap between um, industry not happy with decision making but not wanting to expend large amounts of money on uh, basically court action. Um, <coughs> Uh, there's drone regulation, uh, there's a requirement for us to publish a regulatory strategy. Um, the review process and the regulatory strategy requirement are probably reflections of a sort of a more modern approach to regulation where the level of transparency and accountability that regulators have is expected to be higher than might have been the case in the past. Um, there's some elements that reflect or relate to just culture. They're primarily provisions around how information received by the organisation is used, particularly when it's self-reported. And there's some specific provisions around the use of things like cockpit uh, video recorder information that fit into the sort of general uh, body of, or, or the general theme of just culture. Um, and there's also a change of legal form for the Aviation Security Service. So. As you probably know, we run the Aviation Security Service um, and currently they are also a document holder and they are regulated by the organisation, which is a very unusual arrangement that you know, we have the, the General Manager of Aviation Security Service sitting around the leadership table, also regulated uh, by people around that table. Um, out externally, it's probably not a big deal. It's an important thing from the internal organisational perspective. So that's one of the things that's on the agenda that we're um, very focused on now until April 2025 and beyond, obviously. Uh, we've got a reasonably significant program team working closely with the Ministry of Transport to make sure all of this happens. Um, funding review. So you'll all be familiar with the current government, well, the... Um, future government and indeed the current government focus on the economy and uh, savings in the public sector and the like. Um, we are responding to that just like every other agency will be in terms of providing information to new ministers around what we could do with 2.5 or 5% or 8% or 10% less or whatever the number that gets focused on is. Um, that will affect the level of funding the government provides to our organisation. Uh, but in the background, the big game is actually the funding review because the majority of our organisation's activities are funded through fees, levies and charges. Um, we've done a lot of work preparing for a funding review, but it's been stalled on a number of occasions since pre-COVID, actually. So our funding settings are actually from five or six years ago. Um, the government first of all, didn't want to do funding reviews in the immediate aftermath of COVID for obvious reasons. Now the approach is wanting to get back to full cost recovery as quickly as possible. And I expect that will be followed through by the new government. So one of the thir first things that we'll be doing with our new minister is talking about the uh, funding review process and when and how we're going to do it and seeking support from the minister and the new cabinet to get that out. 
It will follow the usual framework, which is public, club and private good, where public good things are funded by the Crown. The Crown will be looking to minimise its injection into the organisation's um, budgets. Um, the club good is really the stuff that is covered by a levy and is seen as benefiting the system as a whole. And then the private good is certification, um, licensing and the like, where people are granted, I think they're often called privileges or licences or certif certificates to operate from a commercial perspective. So that model is a very well established one which won't change. Um, we have been pretty well supported from, by the government in the COVID and post-COVID period where we've had a big gap in our finances, but um, they do want us to get back to full cost recovery. Um, we also at the moment have no, no reserves, which is unusual for a Crown agent, and that's because we had to expend them in the, in the early parts of the COVID period before the government tipped money into the organisation, which you can see the logic of that, but it means as an organisation we have got very little flexibility, and a good example would be our emerging technology area. Um, we have struggled to get resources to put our emerging technology unit and approach in place, we have managed over the last year or two to do that, but in a situation where we had a reasonable amount of reserves, as you would expect for an organisation like us, we would have had resources to draw on to do that in a more timely fashion. Um, and also the lack of reserves and the funding uncertainty, as you will appreciate, given all of the things that you do, um, does create challenges in terms of any medium or longer term thinking as an organisation. So we're kind of in that space. We're a little bit hand-to-mouth in terms of resourcing, get, trying to get today's work done, uh, parallel with moving forward to the extent that we're able to. Um, so within all of that, um, it's worth reflecting just briefly on the sort of the why, what and how of the organisation. As I mentioned in terms of the Civil Aviation Act itself, the new one doesn't change that we are here to keep the aviation system safe for the public and for the people who work in and use the system. Um, and we protect the aviation system from people who may wish to cause harm to it. So that's the aviation security service role um, and the other regulatory actions that occur in relation to security. So many of the um, participants in our system are subject to both safety and security regulation and certification, as you'd appreciate. So to do that, we actually we regulate um, people that work in and our customers of aviation, pilots, engineers, air traffic controllers, passengers. Um, obviously, we also have people that we delegate to do some of the regulatory work, like sign delegation holders. And our focus, as you know, organisations, aircraft and aviation infrastructure. So the reason for referring to that is simply to orientate around how we're seeing our function. Um, how we do our work, um, a one organisation approach. Any of you that have worked in reasonably large organisations have probably heard this wherever you've worked. There's always a desire to move past organisational silos and join things up and make sure we are taking things from a system approach. That's clearly one of the areas of focus that we have in the organisation and you will also well know that uh, many of the things that we finally deliver or produce do require multiple parts of our organisation to work on them. So the more we see the connections and can do that in a smooth fashion, the better. We've got a strong focus on our values, collaboration, transparency, integrity, respect and professionalism. And the intention is that that's both an internal and an external uh, way of describing the way we are and the way we engage with people. The collaboration one is an interesting one for a regulator. Um, because we also have to have an independent view about things. So when we are collaborating with regulated parties in particular, we have to be very cautious in the way we do that with a clear eye on uh, not being captured. Um, and that will create tensions from time to go at time in terms of how far we can go. But our, our focus is on, as far as possible, working together with people to achieve the sort of joint interests and outcomes uh, they have. Um, we will always wear our independent regulator hat. 
Um, there's three what we refer to as strategic pathways, uh, leadership and influence, and that's the idea that as the aviation regulatory organisation we have a pretty comprehensive view of what's going on across aviation and we should use that beyond our transactional regulatory activities to influence both behaviours and activities as well as policy frameworks and other agencies as much as we can, uh, reasonably of course. Um, we have a strong focus on regulatory stewardship so that goes back to the idea that we really need um, our regulatory systems to be fit for purpose. So the regulatory stewardship con context is simply that. It's like any stewardship thing. You want things to be uh, working okay, updated, fit for the future. That's a real struggle, as I mentioned, in terms of our policy frameworks because of the time and the resource available to do those things. Nevertheless, we are focused on it. And professional regulatory practice, which should speak for itself in terms of making sure that uh, we understand, we have the technical knowledge, the legal knowledge and the regulatory understanding to do our job effectively. And a bottom line sort of, or a driver is wanting to be a modern intelligence led risk based regulator. So that sounds like a bumper sticker but in practice what it means is that we're doing as much as we can to enhance our way we gather, analyse and use information to drive the work that we do so it's focused on the most significant risks. Um, and the modern regulation um, concept is about those things, fit for purpose regulatory frameworks. Uh, talk a little bit about an earned autonomy approach to regulation. So that's, a, uh, that's an approach where we sh if we understand enough about participants and the way they're operating and the quality of their safety management systems and their senior persons and how they're doing their work, um, we can have less to do with them, um, stay out of the way a little bit more. Um, that's the sort of concept of earned autonomy. It's underpinned by a really clear, or it should be a really clear balance between trust and verification though. Um, transparent, responsive, communicative, openness to co-regulation. For us that is, um, uh, it's particularly a good example is our work with 149 organisations, those that we delegate to regulate in the sport and recreation area how we see them as co-regulators and we work with them to achieve safety outcomes rather than seeing them as certificated organisations where our primary engagement is around auditing them. Um, and a balance between goal-based and prescriptive. So I'm sure we all um, appreciate the need for prescription in aviation, but probably we also would like to know what the outcomes that we're trying to achieve are and have freedom to do the best thing to achieve those outcomes. So how we balance that is a constant challenge for regulatory organisation, particularly us as the aviation regulator. So uh, the key issues, um, resourcing and the quality of the regulatory frameworks, fit for purpose and dynamic or not. I think if we took a short poll we might reach the view that they're probably not, probably not as dynamic as they need to be. Um, Collaboration and engagement with a keen eye on avoiding regulatory capture. I think that collaboration is important. Regulatory capture is a risk and regulatory capture is a close cousin of regulatory failure. So we have to be really careful about that as a regulatory organisation. Intelligence led and risk based. One of the fundamental things that assists in that is high levels of industry reporting. Uh, and the industry reporting is probably not at the level that it would be ideal. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but we'll be doing some work on that to try and improve that because the more information and understanding we have, the better we can do our job and the less we can get in the way of things, if that's a concern for people. Um, and using the full range of regulatory tools to achieve outcomes. So we see our regulatory activity as stretching from information right through to enforcement and the idea that you use whatever the right thing is at the right time to affect the outcome that you're trying to achieve from our perspective with a regulated party. So I go back to just to wrap up with the, the VUCA picture. Um, the, what I've seen about this suggests there are ways that you can work and combat the challenges of working in a volatile 
uncertain, complex and ambiguous environment. And all of the things that I've said to you about the way we are thinking about the organisation, uh, you can apply in that sort of framework. One of the things is you, you, know, you can counter volatility with vision. So our focus on being a modern regulator, what that means to us should enable us to work in a volatile uh, environment. Uncertainty with understanding, engagement, collaboration is the antidote to uncertainty. Reacting to the complexity with clarity, uh, that requires transparency, responsiveness and communication and engagement by us. And then ambigu ambiguity, we can fight ambiguity with agility. So that brings in the outcomes focused approach which is very, very challenging in an industry where there is a long and appropriate history of prescription uh, as we introduce that uh, sort of as much flexibility as we can. So um, that's the presentation. Thank you for listening. <laughs>